Hello, my name is William Stoll. I am a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Rheumatology at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. I would like to welcome you to this interactive exchange program. Our goal today is to provide you with scientific and clinical updates on systemic lupus erythematosus, or lupus, including practical recommendations on how to better identify and care for affected patients. First, we will briefly look at some of the factors that contribute to the development and multisystemic manifestations of lupus. We will then examine a few typical and a few less typical patient presentations, including a final module in which you will be asked to help create a case study that reflects some of the issues you find most challenging when managing patients with lupus. As you know, Lupus is characterized by aberrant autoimmune responses that can damage virtually any tissue or organ. The etiology of lupus is complex and intricate and it entails interactions among multiple genetic, environmental, hormonal, and immunoregulatory factors. These factors coalesce to create the underlying characteristic immunobiologic disturbances of lupus including the aberrant production of many cytokines and the aberrant function of T cells, B cells, and cells of the innate immune system, such as dendritic cells and neutrophils. One of the hallmarks of lupus is the generation of autoantibodies. Certain autoantibodies, such as antibodies to double-stranded DNA or SM, are highly specific to lupus and are thus diagnostically valuable. Other autoantibodies are linked to certain clinical manifestations of lupus. For instance, anti-ribosomal P antibodies are associated with neuropsychiatric disease, and anti-cardiolipin antibodies are associated with a heightened risk of intravascular thrombosis. Other autoantibodies are pathogenic, such as anti-SSA antibodies in neonatal lupus. In addition, Immune complexes containing antinuclear antibodies and nuclear material released from dying cells can be highly nephritogenic. Similar immune complexes may localize in the skin and central nervous system where they can recruit inflammatory cells, activate the complement cascade, and induce tissue injury. Not only does this regulation of B cells lead to autoantibody production in lupus, but preclinical studies have compellingly shown that B cells in lupus play an autoantibody independent pathogenic role as well. B cells can present self peptides to naive T cells while concurrently providing co stimulatory molecules that facilitate T cell activation. This leads to autoreactive inflammatory T cell populations that infiltrate tissues, such as the skin and kidneys, causing additional tissue damage. Dysregulated T cells, B cells, and cells of the innate immune system also interact with each other to alter the systemic and local profiles of cytokines. Cytokines are markedly pleiotropic, creating a complex set of synergistic and antagonistic effects that can damage local tissue and hyperactivate various immune cell populations. Cytokines of particular interest include type 1 interferons, interleukin-6 or IL-6, and B cell activating factor, or BAF. Patients with lupus display a so-called interferon signature, that is, an increase in expression of genes activated by type 1 interferons. The interferon signature, which correlates with active disease and increased tissue damage, has been noted in glomerular and synovial tissue, suggesting a role in localized disease manifestations. Interferons can promote B cell activation and antibody production while potentially enhancing the survival of autoreactive B cells. Immune cells from patients with lupus also overproduce IL-6, and increased IL-6 levels have been shown to associate with disease activity. IL-6 promotes B cell activation and autoantibody production. Interestingly, high levels of IL-6 in the cerebrospinal fluid of affected patients may provide a marker of lupus-associated psychosis, and IL-6 expression has been detected in the kidneys of patients with lupus nephritis. Finally, BAF is an essential factor for the survival of most mature B cells. Circulating concentrations of BAF are elevated in many patients with lupus and correlate with disease activity. 
Efforts to develop new therapies for lupus have targeted many of the cytokines and immune cell populations that we have discussed here, although results have at times been disappointing. At times, safety concerns associated with potent immunomodulatory agents may outweigh any clinical benefit. This may reflect the relative nonspecific nature of many treatments, such as antibodies that deplete patients not only of autoreactive B cells, but also of protective and regulatory B cells. Moreover, the diverse mechanisms that can contribute to the development and persistence of lupus may not be present in every patient. For instance, preclinical data suggest that under certain conditions, T cells may not be absolutely required for the development of lupus-associated features. A marked heterogeneity in pathways leading to disease creates a significant hurdle when designing clinical trials and selecting appropriate patients. Nevertheless, the relatively recent approval of a biologic agent directed against BAF suggests that capitalizing on our expanding understanding of the pathogenic mechanisms of lupus may lead to the generation of new therapeutic approaches. Furthermore, a disease as heterogeneous as lupus is unlikely to respond to any single medication. Ongoing research will hopefully provide additional therapeutic options as well as methods to translate a patient's genetic, molecular, and immune cell profiles into personalized treatment regimens. I want to thank you for your time today. Now that we have taken a look at some of the cellular and molecular elements that contribute to the development and progression of lupus, let's turn to a few case studies that illustrate typical and more complex disease presentations as well as various approaches to management.